Hi, I'm Jeremy, the Zoo Nerd, coming to you live from my backyard in beautiful Los Angeles, California. How's everybody doing today? I hope you're well. I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're staying safe. And I hope you're learning something. Today's Critter Chat is going to talk about a group of animals we've not yet discussed. These guys. The amphibians. Now this isn't a real one, it's one made out of rock. This was a gift from my grandparents when they went to Africa to me. And I've always uh, really liked this. It's beautiful, green's my favorite color. But it also helped me learn a little bit that frogs are something that's kind of found around the world. And although they're little, they're kind of an important thing to us as people, culturally. They're in a lot of our stories, a lot of our songs, a lot of our um, childhood stories especially. And they're kind of very important to their, our environment and their environment as well. Today we're gonna talk about amphibians in this critter chat. Now amphibians is a big group of animals. Uh, it's, uh, it's a class. So if you were to compare that to uh, other animals, a class is the same level as like amphibians. It's the same level as like birds or mammals or reptiles. And we've not yet talked about any of them, so I felt it was time that we do. My notes blew around, so let me change that real quick. All right. So there's a couple things that make amphibians amphibians. In general, they're kind of small especially compared to the other animals. They're little, like my rock frog. Some are bigger, some are even smaller, but in general, they're pretty small. They're also vertebrates. That means they have a skeleton. Skeleton of bones or cartilage that's inside their body. That's important because uh, some animals that look a lot like them or that they look a lot like uh, don't have that. And so that's a, a good determining factor. Now, amphibians are also ectotherms or cold blooded. We've talked about that a couple times with talking about the different reptiles, but that means that they rely on their outside environment to control their body temperatures. Um, so because of that, they kind of rely on the weather. So the sun, um, or other things to help regulate that temperature. Um, they also have a very unique skin. Uh, frogs have kind of a very thin, or amphibians I should say, I keep saying frogs because that's the one we're all most familiar with. Um, but they have thin permeable skin. Permeable is a big word, but it means that air and water can pass through it. Uh, think of it kind of like a t-shirt like a cotton t-shirt like I have on. If you were to hold this t-shirt over your face, you could still breathe through it, right? You could still get air into your nose and into your mouth. And if you were to hold it under a sink or running water from a hose, the water would still pass through the t-shirt. So their skin is kind of like this, thin, permeable, things can move through it, which is really unique. Most amphibians have this, no other animals really do, or it's very rare that they can do anything like this. Because of that, they must live in areas that are usually very damp or moist climates. Um, typically, you will find more amphibians kind of near the equator in the tropical zone of the world, places like rainforest or islands, um, places where uh, there's a lot of moisture or around places with moisture. So around lakes, rivers, streams. And that's important to them so they don't dry out. There are some that live in deserts. Um, they're well adapted to doing so. Um, but usually a hot place or a dry place is kind of a bad place for an amphibian. So they're much more common in places that are more moist. Also, they don't do well in super, super cold. Again, there's some exceptions that survive in colder areas, but you won't find amphibians at the poles, the North Pole or the South Pole, Antarctica. Um, but they are found on all the other continents. So North and South America, 
Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia, and on many of the islands around the world. Now, the other thing that really makes frogs unique is that they go through something called metamorphosis. That comes from a Greek word, which means two lives. And for most amphibians, they kind of start life looking one way, and then they go through a big change and come out the other side looking another way. So if you think about a frog, uh, they start from an egg. Their eggs are also pretty different. We've talked about eggs with reptiles and with birds. Um, the eggs for birds usually have a hard shell, right? Think of a chicken egg. Their shell is very hard, very solid. Reptile eggs I've described as being pretty leathery. So it's kind of a thinner skin than the hard shell of a uh, bird egg. Well, frogs are even more thin than that. Um, if you've ever had like boba tea, that's what a frog egg reminds me of. It's very squishy, very slimy. Um, yeah, and kind of like frog skin, I believe those eggshells can also have a lot of things pass through them, the air, the water, nutrients. But they start out in these eggs. The eggs are usually laid in water, though not always. And then when they hatch, they are usually in kind of a larva stage or a very um, small, moving different kind of stage. So for me, when I was a kid, nearby where I grew up in my neighborhood, there was this area that was kind of a big bowl of dirt. Um, and in the middle of it, it would fill with snow during the winter. And in the spring, that snow would all melt and be kind of a pond. Um, and there was a ditch that ran through that brought water to the farmer's fields just the other side of it. And so there was always kind of water in this area. And it kind of gathered in a shallow pool, a shallow pond here. And in the, in the spring and early summer, myself, my brother, my friends, we'd go down and we'd catch little tadpoles, baby frogs. Um, they kind of look like fish, if you've ever seen one. They're kind of a little shaped differently, though. They're kind of chubby at the front, their head, and then it kind of tapers off to a tail at the bottom. They wiggle around kind of like a fish in the water. A tadpole, or a baby frog, uses gills to breathe, like a fish, underwater. And then as it starts to get a little older and develops a little more, it starts to grow little legs out the back and then its front legs start to grow. Its tail starts to shrink. And during that time, it also starts to develop lungs and it will come to the surface to breathe more. And then when it's big enough, it will be in and out of the water and can hop out onto the ground when its legs get big enough. And usually when they're adults, they come out of the water altogether. Um, going back to the water to sometimes move or breed or eat but uh, spend most of their adult time on land. Now there's some exceptions to that. There's always exceptions. And so not all amphibians come out on the land. Not all of them always start in the water either. There's a lot of variation there. But that process of changing life, changing how they look, uh, changing how they live, changing what they eat, that's called metamorphosis. And most amphibians undergo metamorphosis or have kind of two phases of life where they change the, the way they look and the way they move. And it's a pretty interesting thing, and it um, really helps us understand kind of more about what amphibians are. Now, amphibians, there's over 7,400 species that have been identified by science. So that's a lot of numbers, a large number, a lot of individual uh, kinds or species out there. And those can be broken down into three orders or groups under the, the class level of amphibian. So the first one is frogs and toads. And frogs and toads are pretty common. We know what they are. Most people have seen a frog or a toad, maybe in your yard, maybe out in nature, maybe in your neighborhood or nearby. Um, but we generally know what a frog or a toad is. The second group is newts and salamanders. Those are a little more tricky. Um, I remember when I first saw them, I thought they were a lizard, but they're not. They're an amphibian, but they kind of have that same body shape as a lizard, although a little bit different head looking uh, than a lizard, lizard might have. 
and definitely different with the skin and the environment they live in. They don't have that dry skin like a reptile. They have a moist skin, more like a frog. And the third group is uh, the most unique and kind of different, and I still don't fully understand them, called the Sicilians. Now, I have seen them. I've seen them at the Phoenix Zoo. We had some on exhibit when I was there. And they look like earthworms, but they live underwater. But they're not earthworms. Earthworms are very squishy throughout. They don't have any skeleton. They don't have any bones. And Sicilians have bones. So they look like an earthworm, but they function a bit different. But we don't know a lot about them because they live underwater and they live underground. And so it's rare for most people to ever see them out in the wild. And even if we do see one, we may not know what it is. We might just think it's a worm. But with the amphibians, there's over 6,500 kinds of frogs and toads. There's over 600 kinds of newts and salamanders. And there's over 200 types of Sicilians. And so together, that's a lot of different individuals. And because most of them are small, we sometimes overlook them. We sometimes forget about them. We sometimes don't know they're there. But they are very important to their ecosystem. They're very important to us, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, how big is the biggest amphibian? The biggest ones are some salamanders that are called giant salamanders, and compared to the rest of the group of amphibians, they are absolutely huge. Giant salamanders live in two places, China and Japan, and they live in the mountain streams, kind of higher elevations, in both those countries. So it's rare that people see them and they usually kind of hide in dark, murky water, um, in fast flowing mountain streams where there's not as many people around. So we don't know a whole lot about them either, but they are big. They're like five to six feet big. So they're almost as long as I am tall. They can weigh over a hundred pounds. So that's huge, right, for an amphibian when most of them are this size. The giant salamanders are way, way bigger. Now, how small is the smallest one? The smallest one is a little frog called the gold frog. Gold frogs are a third of an inch in length, just tiny. They're about as big as my thumbnail, the fingernail on my thumb. They're itty bitty, little tiny guys. They are bright colored yellow, so you will probably see one if you're around one but they're so little, you may not. And they come in all sizes in between, although most of them are pretty small. Now with all these species, 7,400 uh, species of amphibians have been identified by science. And they're still finding new species every year. But there's kind of something really sad going on for amphibians and scientists and conservationists are calling it an extinction crisis. More than a third of all total amphibian species are threatened with extinction. So that's over 1,800 uh, species. Since 1980, over 100 have most likely gone extinct in the last 40 years. Some of those we don't know. Sometimes they identify and find a new species, but there's so few of them out there, we don't even know if they're endangered or not. But they can't find enough of them to really say. And even though not all of them are endangered, 43% have shown population declines in the last decade or so. That's almost half. And on the other side, only 1% are showing population increases. So that's pretty crazy. Amphibians are facing the greatest extinction of any group of animals out there. More of them are threatened than others. And that's an interesting thing for a lot of scientists and conservationists. It's a sad thing, but it's also an important thing. With their skin, right, that permeable skin that can absorb air and can absorb water, they can breathe through it. They can get a drink through their skin. They also can absorb a lot of toxins, poisons, and that often causes a lot of trouble for them. 
So some of their big threats are things like habitat destruction, as people reroute rivers, build canals or dams, or take water to put on to crops and farmland. That can cause big problems for amphibians. Sorry, my notes keep blowing, it's a little breezy. I'm just gonna fix the tape. Hopefully that helps. Okay. <laughs> but so habitat destruction is a big part of a problem for amphibians. And as we cut down forests, especially the tropical forests, that's another big part. As we clear land to grow crops, we're taking away homes of lots of different kinds of animals. And some of these amphibians are very specialized. They only live in a small area. They need a very special tree or they need a special flower or something else is very important in their environment. And if we wipe that out, they can easily be wiped out with it. They're also very sensitive, like I mentioned, to pollution through that skin can absorb a lot of toxins. So if there's chemicals out there, if there's pesticides, things that kill bugs, bugs are actually the thing that amphibians eat the most. So if the bugs are getting poisoned, the frogs and the toads, the salamanders, they may be getting poisoned along with it. Or if we wipe out all the bugs in an area, there may not be any food for them. We may wipe them out because we get rid of their food source. They're also very susceptible to climate change. They need very specialized temperatures. They can't regulate their own temperature and they have this very tricky skin that needs the moisture to be just right. So if things are hotter than they used to be, that can help them, that can cause them to dry out. If the rain doesn't happen as much and if there's droughts, that causes them to dry up. If there's more rain than is possible, that can cause their eggs to not develop right or their problems with their food, with their habitat. If it's continually flooding in their pond, they need slower water. Rushing water isn't a safe place for most amphibians. So climate change is huge for them. If they live in a coastal environment near the ocean, but not in the ocean, during high tides when the sea water comes into what used to be wetlands, it may kill the amphibians that live there. Rising sea levels is a big problem in a lot of places around the world. Places with low elevations face that problem every month during the high tides. Places like Southern Florida, Hawaii, Maryland. Those are just places here in the US that face a lot of problems. And there's places all over the world that face that flooding every month as the oceans rise in elevation. There's also a disease that's threatening a lot of amphibians. It's called the chytrid fungus. It was identified in the early 2000s. Uh, the scientists didn't really know what it was at first, but they noticed that there's a disease killing amphibians. They identified it as a fungus. A fungus is another living thing, right? The most common fungus that we know are mushrooms. So it's not like mushrooms, but it's kind of like mushrooms. And it grows on their skin and it causes a lot of health problems and it causes them to die. And it wipes out entire populations within a month or two months, three months. So there's all these problems and there's a lot of frogs and toads and salamanders that are endangered. But why do we care? Why is it important to us? Frogs and toads, amphibians, salamanders, they're the first to disappear if there's problem in the ecosystem. Scientists have identified them as nature's indicators. When there's something wrong, they're the first to struggle, the first to disappear. And if they disappear, then that's a wake up call. That's an alarm going off that there's a problem. That's a problem that other animals are gonna face. Other things that may rely on their food chain or may be caused by, without the amphibians there, the things the amphibians eat may cause problems for others. That's a big problem for us. What do frogs eat? They eat bugs. One of the things that frogs eat the most are mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are actually the most deadly animal on the planet because of their ability to carry disease to humans. Diseases like malaria, typhoid, yellow fever. Those diseases can kill people. 
those diseases do kill people. Without frogs around, there's more mosquitoes. When there's more mosquitoes, those disease rates go up. So we should care about amphibians going extinct because they're part of the problem or part of the solution that can benefit everyone. A balanced ecosystem helps all. So what can we do? In the early 2000s, when they identified this problem of citrid fungus and realized so many amphibians were facing an extinction, uh, a lot of conservation organizations really started to work more on solutions with that. In 2008, they declared it the year of the frog for zoos and aquariums across the world. And many zoos or aquariums took on a special project, took on a species that was in danger to see if they could help out. And as we're now several years past that, it's great to look back at some of those success stories. So one of those is the Bronx Zoo, a zoo in New York City. The Bronx Zoo decided to take on a species of toad, a species that is called the Kaihanzi spray toad. They come from a very, very small place in Africa, in Tanzania. They only live in one gorge, one valley, at the base of one waterfall in a space that's five acres. That's it. It's the only place they live in the world. This little toad is unique to just that area. And in the early 2000s, they were looking for a, a frog species they could help out with. This frog species was, or toad was identified to them as an amphibian that they could take on as a conservation project. So they sent people to Africa they helped round up some of these toads. They took 490 of them. They brought them back to the United States. They put them in the Bronx Zoo and several other zoos, but it was coordinated by the Bronx. And they learned what those toads needed to eat. They learned their specific humidity, uh, what they needed temperature wise, what they needed for uh, the soil, for the plants around them, for their food. And they figured out all those things. Then they figured out what they needed to be able to breed and reproduce and have babies. When they went back to Tanzania, there were none left. But there were still all those that they had taken to the zoos and they had figured out how to help them reproduce. A couple years later, they were able to go back to Tanzania with little toads, with new toads to reintroduce into that habitat. They started working with local conservationists in Tanzania who could help run a facility there at the site to help monitor the population of this very rare species of toad. They released the toads from the zoo back out into the wild and they helped monitor them. They still have some in the zoos. They're still breeding them. They're working with their partners in Africa to help monitor the situation to make sure that that species survives. The Bronx Zoo is not the only zoo doing things like this. Most zoos do, or most good zoos do. When I was at the Phoenix Zoo in Arizona, they had been working on, with a species called the Chiricahuan leopard frog. It's a beautiful frog, it's a good sized frog that lives in the high mountain areas of Eastern Arizona and Western New Mexico, and a little bit down into Mexico itself. Chiricahua and leopard frogs were very endangered. They were vulnerable to extinction. They had partnered with Arizona Game and Fish to help work with them. They found some out in the wild that had laid some eggs. They brought the eggs to the zoo and there they did careful observations to figure out what temperatures the water needed, what other factors they needed to help as many of those eggs hatch as possible. Over years, they perfected this process and since then, they've been able to uh, raise many eggs into little frogs. And then when they're little frogs, they take them back to the mountain streams and lakes and reintroduce them out into the wild. To date, they have released over 25,000 Chiricahua and leopard frogs back into the wilds of Arizona and New Mexico. That's phenomenal. That's huge. That's so many more than were out there before they began this project. During that, they figured out how to make sure that all the environmental factors that the frogs needed 
in a captive setting could be met. And they've shared that information with other zoos who are working with other species of amphibians. So that there's kind of a template. You need to figure out what temperature the water needs to be. You need to figure out what uh, pH level the water is. You need to figure out what kind of sunlight they need. You need to figure out the humidity in the air. You need to figure out what they need to eat. And when you get all those things in just the right range, you have the most success of the eggs hatching and the babies developing into frogs in a good way. When they become a full-size frog, they're gonna survive easier than if you took the tadpole out or the egg out into the wild. At the Los Angeles Zoo, they've done a similar thing with a species of frog native to Southern California that lives in the San Gabriel and San Jacinto Mountains surrounding LA and Orange County. The mountain yellow-legged frogs, it took them a long time to figure it out. They struggled for a while to figure out what exactly these frogs needed. And it was frustrating. It was years at a time before they figured out what could happen, how they could help. But they finally cracked the code. They figured it out. The last three years, they've had really good success with mountain yellow-legged frogs. They keep adults at the zoo, at Los Angeles Zoo, and also San Diego Zoo is working with this species as well. And those frogs breed in the zoo setting and lay eggs. Eggs bite the thousands. And then those eggs hatch and become tadpoles and then they metamorphosize and become little frogs. And when they do, they've sent them back out into the mountains of Southern California. That's a harsh environment. The mountains can get very cold in the winter, but it's very dry in the summer. During the droughts that we've had here in Southern California, those mountain streams dried up. Those mountains have caught fire multiple years in a row. That all causes problems for the habitat there. The species would probably be extinct now if it weren't for the zoos working to save them. Similarly, a frog species in Northern California has been a project that the San Francisco Zoo has worked on, the red-legged mountain frogs their release site is in Yosemite National Park. And last year was the first year they were able to successfully take little frogs from the zoo and re-release them out into the streams and meadows of Yosemite National Park. Most of the big zoos, most of the good zoos in the United States are working on a species of amphibian or multiple species of amphibians that they're working to help with. And they're doing a lot of really great work Together they partner with one of our special shout outs, a conservation organization called Amphibian Arc. Amphibian Arc specializes in helping identify species out in the wild that need some help. And a zoo or an aquarium or a conservation organization that has some money, some space, some expertise in raising animals in a captive setting. And they make sure that those two things meet up. And then they help educate the local people help educate the people in the zoo setting to help figure out what these amphibians need. And they're doing a lot of really great work around the world. Now there's ways you can help out too. There's another program here in the United States that's called Frog Watch USA. If you live near a lake, a river, a stream, if you ever see or hear a frog, you can record that. You can take a video, you can take a photo, you can upload that data to Frog Watch USA. They can help identify the species that lives near you. You can say where you live and they create a big map of all the amphibian species in the US. Amphibians are so small, it's hard to get a good number of how many of them are out there and what species are out there and where. And we can all help out. Now there are two amphibian species that are actually some problems that cause problems. One of them is a species called the American bullfrog. It's a big frog. It was common in the uh, southeastern area of the United States. It can now be found globally. It's been introduced to other continents, to other countries, and it's a big frog. It's an aggressive frog. It eats other frogs and it outcompetes them for resources. The American bullfrog is now an invasive species in many places around the world and it's caused a lot of problems. There's another invasive species that's an amphibian. It's called the cane toad. The cane toad is a big problem in Australia where it got introduced 
and is wiping out species and com out competing other species in Australia. So sometimes amphibians are in trouble, sometimes amphibians are the trouble. But together we can all make a difference and we can all help out. I hope you've enjoyed what I've shared with you today about amphibians. I hope you've learned some things. I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're having fun. Until tomorrow, take care. Be safe. Be happy. Stay at home. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye.